Hello, my name's Tanya, sometimes known as Opus Anglicanum, and I'm going to show you today a little project in laden couch work, which is the technique used in most of my kits. The project will be available to download on my website as well as a, a free PDF pattern so you can use it as you please. And we're doing this little swirly ram. And I've already done Bertie on the left here, I'm going to do Bertram on the right. And I'm going to make some slight differences between the two because there are different ways that you can work this technique. And the biggest difference I'm going to do is that for Bertram, I'm going to give him a coloured fleece. And that's mainly because working white on white is actually quite difficult to see on the camera. So I'm going to do him in different colours, starting with a red. So I'm using a double strand of cruel wool. And the wool in all of my kits is naturally dyed. So this one here is a madder red, which is a root plant, which contains a nice bright colour. So you usually take the line, what I call the line of least resistance. So for Bertie, I've gone from side to side because that's the longest stitch you can do on his body. But because Bertram is going to be stripey, I'm going to do him top to bottom because I want his stripes to be vertical. So I'm going to take my double strand out and I've come out just to the outside of the line because I've used a permanent marker so I need to cover it up completely. And I'm going to bring that double thread all the way up in a nice straight vertical line and come down right there. And then I'm not going to come all the way around the back and come up here. This is a medieval technique. So all of the thread that would have been used originally to do this technique would have been hand spun. And I'm sure a lot of you spin and quite a few of those will spin drop spindle as well. Now, don't worry if that happens sometimes, it does happen. It just means that you're getting your threads nice and close together. So I've gone down and I'm coming up just one thread across from where I've gone down. Those of you who do spin will know that it's very difficult actually to spin something fine enough to then ply it into two and make a two-ply cruel weight thread. So you know, there would have been several spinners probably for every embroiderer, just as there would have been several spinners supplying every weaver in the Middle Ages. So the thread itself was quite a precious and expensive resource. But some of the dyes were quite expensive as well. This good madder that I'm using... I tend to find that the Turkish madders give me the really good reds, French madders give me pink reds, and English ones give me brownish reds. So, then this would have been a first batch madder as well, so the most expensive and intense of those madder colours. So I'm just going up and down across the surface of my design. Now I'm coming to a point here where the design wiggles a bit on the side. And you can see that this thread actually does spread out a little bit as you're working with it. So what I'm going to do to get that wiggle nice and tight is I'm just going to push that thread aside a little bit before I go down. Otherwise, when you couch the thread, when you make it sit still, you'll end up with a big gap there. So I'm just going to finish off that little bit there, up and down. Just finish off that little shape there. So you can see that my stitches are decreasing in size quite a bit. And I've just got enough left on that needle to do one more stitch over the top there. So I'm going to turn it over now and show you what the back will look like at this stage. You can see that the back here, the colour essentially just shows 
as a row of little stab stitches along the edge of the design. I've got a couple of little travels over the back. That's where I was going from one lumpy bit to another. And that's where I went from the edge of that lumpy bit to finish that one last stitch and use my thread up. I'm going to finish that off by just going through the back here because I've already done his legs because they're, I wanted to show you how to use, use the stitch on a larger piece of fabric because it's easier to see. So I did those little bits first. So I'm going to move on to do the rest of my stripes and I'll come back to you when I've finished all those, all that filling. So that's the whole of his fleece now covered. And you can see that all I've got apart from my starts and finishes is a raw around the edge of little stab stitches. All of the colour is on the front. Now you want to keep it that way as well because not only will you use twice as much thread if you go across the back, but also it makes this particular stitch look quite lumpy and unwieldy. You get a much better finish because everything's on the surface and it's not becoming too thick because wool is quite a thick thread. Here we've got the threads on the front and what we've got here in terms of natural dyes is madder, madder, that's the second bath of madder, that's the first bath, so that's a weaker dye, weld, weld over dyed with ward, ward, cochineal with an iron mordant and just exhaust cochineal. So we've got these nice stripes across his body. But the problem with this is these very, very long stitches, and in some versions of this technique, the stitches can be over a foot long. These stitches are really quite unstable. And as soon as I take this piece off my embroidery frame, they're going to start wandering around all over the place. They're going to get snagged. They're going to get pulled. So this technique, as well as sometimes being used, at, uh, known as laid and couch work, is all... Uh, sometimes known as bias stitch, is also known more properly as laid and couched work. So the rainbow stripes I've just done, they're the laid work. I've laid down some stitches and now I'm going to do the couching. Couché, of course, in French meaning to lie or to sit. So we're going to make the sit stitches sit still. And to do that, we're going to go down to a single thread. Now you can see that on Bertie over there, I've couched the colours with the same colour as I've used for the laid work. Obviously I can't do that with Bartram because he's got lots and lots of different colours on him. So instead I'm just going to couch these in a natural undyed white. And I'm going to use just a single thread instead of the double that we've been using. If you use a double on top, again, it becomes very lumpy, it becomes very thick. So I've just got a single thread. And the thing I would say as well is always use a shorter length of thread for your single because this laid work doesn't stress the wool very much, but the couching does because we're going to be do using a lot more stitches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put another huge, great big long stitch right across his body. And then I'm going to go down. Now that stitch is still quite unstable. It's just as unstable as the rest. So I'm going to work my way across that stitch with a row of little stab stitches about four millimeters apart. And I'm just going to stabilize that long couching stitch by couching down the long bar. So you might think, oh, I've done loads so far. I've, I've colored in all of that and, and I've done loads and loads of progress. Now you get to the bit where it slows down a little bit. It's a little bit deceptive. It's not like doing huge, great, big, long satin stitches because we're going to stabilize the stitches. So I'm just working my way across about four millimeters apart. All the way across. Now there are some versions of couching stitches where you put all the bars in at once. But I always recommend, especially for beginners, to put one bar down, stabilize it, and then do the next one because you want the bars nice and evenly spaced. 
and by doing one bar at a time you make sure that you get them that nice even spacing. So this white across the top will actually tone down those colours a little bit and he might end up looking a bit more pastel-y than he originally did because I quite like that russety red, that's a gorgeous colour. So once I've stabilised that row, I'll go on to do my next row and you want the rows again to be spaced about four millimetres apart, so the same width as you've got your little couching stitches. And what often helps to get them nice and straight is just to hold the thread across and then put your needle down because that's going to tell you where the end of it's going to be and you're going to get it nice and straight. Now, once I go to put my next row in, you can see that I'm not spacing the stitches in exactly the same way. I'm staggering them. I'm using a sort of brick arrangement. And that's to prevent these little stitches from pushing the background stitches apart because if you line them all up they're going to start to push each other apart they're going to push the background stitch apart so i'm just going over the top and i'm going to continue doing those row after row until i've covered the whole of his little stripy fleece So there we've got Bartram with his stripes all nice and stabilised there. And you can use stripes in lots of different ways. I've got here, uh, this is a monkey on the back of an elephant. And you can see that here his stripes are made by two just very slightly different contrasting oranges couched in one of the oranges. And whichever one of those oranges I'd used for the couching would have made him darker or lighter. So couching with the lighter orange makes him lighter. Couching with the darker orange would have made him look a little bit darker. Um, we've also got, this one's slightly rude, this is uh, a medieval pilgrim branch. And this is the technique we're going to be using next, which is using the contrasting laid bars as a way of creating a texture and pattern. In this case, the pubic hair and uh, here, the pubic hair again, but only using the stabbing stitches as the contrast. On her walking stick, I've used a diagonal couching stick to make uh, stitch to make a sort of candy cane twirled effect. That uh, trellis stitch that's on her hat is widely used as well and that's used a lot for just contrasting. In medieval embroidery you often see this trellis stitch done with a contrast coloured couching where it's a diamond of, of bars instead of the straight bars and that's done with often with seed heads and flower pods but I've also used it on this little viking girl to make the contrast on the bottom of her dress, just as a little bit of patterning there. Um, this kit is Freya, this, uh, the dogs is the hounds, they're all available. But um, it's also used this technique in the much more refined embroidery of Opus Anglicanum. So here we've got my new book, which comes out in a couple of weeks. And this is Opus Anglicanum done with silk. But in the later period, they use the trellis couching and the laden couched work to fill in large areas. But it's also used in the earlier period as well. So we're going to do a slightly more sophisticated little bit of stitching on his horn because you can see from Bertie there that we want these couching bars to sort of radiate and spiral round and round. So we're going to do that by manipulating the laid work so that we can put the couching down in that spiralled pattern. So I'm going to start right on his brow there and I'm going to work across at an angle. So I've gone just across that angle there, and I've got a tangle, obviously, because you only ever get tangles when you film. 
So I'm going across at an angle and this top bit here, I'm just going to fill that in just as you would normally. And it's only going to take a few stitches there. And then once I've filled in this top section, I'm going to move on to spiralling round his horns. So I'm going to come out on the outer edge. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that aside and tuck it under. And then I'm moving along a couple of strands and I'm angling the next thread. And then I'm spacing these out a little bit more than I would normally along the outer edge of the spiral and tucking under. And you can see that the angle of my stitch has already moved quite a bit from that angle to that angle. So I'm making it curve around. And I'm doing that by sort of slightly overlapping the stitches on the inner edge of the spiral and spacing them out a little bit along the outer edge. So my one layer of stitching is much shorter than the other. And with this variation, we are going to see a little build up of stitch on the back of the work. I'm going to take a few stitches straight across there. And then I'm going to continue spiraling. First of all, I'm going to fill in that little gap there. You don't have to follow the pattern exactly. The pattern, I think, with embroidery is only ever a guideline. So I'm going to bring my next layer out slightly under that one. And then down. And then slightly around the corner. And up and under. And then that one's slightly underneath and down a little. And I'm changing the angle that the thread sits at. So that it's beginning to spiral right the way around here. So you can see that I've changed in that short space, I've changed from that angle to that angle. It's gone right round. And I'm going to continue doing that till I get to the end of the horn. So it's going to spiral round like a proper ram's horn would. So I've continued to spiral that horn around, constantly changing the angle of the stitches as I do so. And by the time you get to the top, you just have to move that round a little bit. Now there is a diagram fully explaining this technique in the instruction book that comes with any of my kits. So that if your kit needs this technique, you can play with it using the instructions that are written down as well. Now, 
now that I've put that lovely spiral in, the whole point of it is to emphasise it by using a contrasting couched bar. And I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to use a sort of very dark black, actually. Give him nice sparkly horns, because he's much bolder primary colours than his little friend Bertie. So I'm going to start off with a double strand because unlike the couching on his body and on his fleece where I want the couching to be as inconspicuous as possible, here I really want to make a feature of it. So I'm going to use a double. And in this case, because it's a very short strand and because I want to emphasize it, to get them all in the right order and at the right angle, because I want to re-emphasize that spiral, I'm going to do all of my couching bars in my double thread all at the same time so that I can get that spiral really flowing around the shape of his horns. And that's going to emphasize the texture of his horns in there. So I'm still maintaining that 90 degree angle of the couching that we've got on the couching of the fleece and just doing it on an angle and using it a bit more creatively for emphasis. And you do find both of these techniques to a limited extent, not so much on the Bayer tapestry, but on the other pieces done in this technique that are found throughout the Middle Ages. The technique actually gets more sophisticated as you go through the Middle Ages, because the Bayer tapestry is kind of the technique in its infancy, and it gets more sophisticated as you go along. So once I've got those couching bars all laid down, I want to just couch them in a single thread. So I'm going to anchor that at the back. And because I've been using a doubled over thread, loop through the needle, I'm just gonna anchor it through itself at the back. Whoops. And then I'm just going to cut one of the threads so that I've got a single. And I'm going to use that single to couch down the bars across the horns and stabilise them. And to be honest, most of the time with this, we're only going to need one or two couching points because they're very narrow. So I've couched down those black bars that give texture to the horns. And I'm going to start on the outlining and the detailing first. And the first stitch that I'm using is split stitch. Now split stitch and stem stitch are the main stitches used in medieval embroidery as outline stitches, but Split is used extensively as a filling in the more high status technique of Opus Anglicanum. So if you look at the book, all of this on these three kings, all of this on the front cover, this is all split stitch. And it's used in a very densely packed way and it's modelled to show the shapes of things. We're not using it in quite that sophisticated a way. We're just using it here as an outline stitch. And it's called split stitch because as I go through each stitch, I'm splitting it in two. I'm actually going through the stitch. And I usually advise if you make a mistake in split stitch, try and actually cover it up with another stitch rather than unpicking it because this is a very, very difficult stitch to unpick because essentially you're destroying your stitch as you go along. 
Now, split stitch and stem stitch are pretty much the same stitch, but done slightly differently. Because if I was going to do stem stitch, I would push my thread to one side rather than go through it. And they're both quite closely related to the more common back stitch as well. Because if you're going to do either of them properly, the back of them should look exactly like back stitch. So when I get up to the point of his horns, I'm going to do one extra tiny stitch. I'm going to come up through it. And then I'm going to work my way around the rest of his horn as well. And when I'm working down the edge of a shape, you can see that here at the very tip of his horn, I've actually gone straight over the laden couched work and created the division in the horn using that. And I'll do the same thing when I come down to his hooves as well. But I'm actually going right in through the same holes that the edge of the laden couch work uses. Because if you go even one thread of the background canvas to the side, you'll end up with a gap. What you want is a nice tight edge on the edge of that horn. You don't want any gaps between the outline and the body of the horn. And when I come up to here, I'm just going right down into the channel between the two stitches. Now you find sometimes the Bayer Tapestry uses the stem stitch or the split stitch first and then fills in. But later stuff can do it either way. And there are definitely pieces that could only be done by having the outline done last and on top of the laden couch work. And I find this much easier, especially for beginners, because you don't get that problem with the gaps around the edges and you get a much nicer finish to your work. So I'm just going to continue going around the edge of the horn. So now I've done the outline of his horns, I'm going to continue my split stitch down and do the outline of his face. Because I'm not going to do him exactly the same as young Bertie here. Bertie has his face filled in by the laden couchwork so that he has a blue face. Whereas Bartram here is going to have a white face, the colour of the background canvas, in the style that's used in the Bayer Tapestry which is pretty much unique to the Bio Tapestry, actually. Every other piece of laden couchwork embroidery has the faces filled in in some way. In some, you get a wool embroidery of laden couchwork with an Opus Anglicanum style face. Uh, specifically, that's found in the Reckihild Antipendium or Ultrafrontal from Iceland. So... With him, I'm going to go for the buyer style and just outline his face. And I might as well do that now because I've got that little bit of black left in the needle from doing his horn. So I need to go down to nice small stitches. Oh, I pulled one out there. I need to go down to really small stitches when I'm going round the little curves of his nose and his face. And it's a much quicker way of doing the face, actually, than trying to do it in a complex Opus Anglicanum style. And it works very well for animals. I think it's much better for animals than it is for humans. Because it's you don't get the same level of expression on animals' faces that you do in humans. So I'm just going to take that up there a little bit. And then I'm going to do his eye. I 
think these two are about, ha about to have a headbutting contest, actually. They look like they're giving each other stink eye, don't they? Which is why most farmers don't keep very many rams around, I suppose. They just headbutt each other to death. Silly boys. I'm just going to do his pupil. Oh, he does look grumpy, doesn't he? He's going to do his pupil by going over there and just leaving that little bit of negative space for the white of his eye. I'm going to do a quick demonstration of how to do the split stitch as a freestanding thing. I'm using a double thread so you can see it a little bit better. So I come out, I come down, and then I come up halfway along and halfway through the stitch that I've just done. And then I progress the stitch the same length. So I'm only progressing half a stitch with each stitch that I do. They're overlapping each other. So the next stitch goes half a stitch along and I come up halfway through. Half a stitch along and halfway through, half a stitch along, and when I come back up, I'm actually coming up at the point where the previous stitch went down, and then I'm going through. So half a stitch along, and halfway through. Now there is a temptation to speed things up by lengthening the stitch, doing twice as long, and not going all the way back. But the trouble is when you do that, you end up with a very jagged stitch that doesn't flow. The idea of a good split stitch is it should look like a little rope and that does not look like a rope. So I'll show you the back. So this is the back of my split stitch. Ignore that bit, that's the bit where I split from one stitch to another. This bit here, this is the good split stitch and you can see that it pretty much looks like back stitch. It doesn't always connect up, but it, it's almost there. And then here, this is the bad split stitch where it's all spaced out and it's stabby and dotty and all over the place. I'm not one of those people who obsesses over what the back of your stitching should look like. But very often the back of a stitch can help you understand what the front of it looks like because it helps you understand the structure. And this is one of those cases. This is the stitch instruction leaflet that you get with all of the laden couch uh, in kits. So it's got instructions nice and simple and bold for all of the laden couched work, what it should look like. It's got some front and back stitches. It's got some troubleshooting as well, how to fix your repairs. It's got the uh, angled laden couch work explained there. It's got trellis couch explained. And then it's got instructions for your split stitch, your stem stitch, and your couch outline stitches as well. And you get one of those with each of the kits and they're exactly the same as I would put in uh, I was give out when I'm teaching a class. Little curls and whirls are finished. I'm just going to finish him off by outlining his legs and feet. Now you can see that I've already done the hind legs. Oh, I missed that one a bit. That's not very neat. I've already done the hind legs, but what I'm doing now is I'm kind of separating out the lumps of his two legs by just delineating where each leg should be. And again, I'm just following the outline round because there's clearly a definition in the outline of where his two little hooves should go. So I'm just working my way up there. You don't have to go actually all the way up. It can sometimes look nice if there's a little gap. And then all the way down. I'm using a blue just to bring some of the fleece colour down into his feet. 
medieval embroidery is very economical with colour. You don't get huge, you know, palettes of colours of using 30 or 40 or 50 colours. You sort of have, well, rainbow colours, black and white, basically, and a bit of brown, and maybe some different shades of those colours. So he's quite a nice little demonstration of how simple the colouring of medieval embroidery is. And the other thing is that I'm using the blue because medieval embroidery doesn't actually very often go for black outlines. It might do a partial black outline like we've got up there. But if you look at something like the Bayer Tapestry, it's not all outlined in black. It's outlined in black and blue and yellow and green and all the other colours that are used in the, the rest of the embroidery. So... There's my two little sheepies, Bertie and Bartram. Side by side, I think they're about to headbutt heads. They're, they're having an argument, aren't they? Ah, well, I hope you enjoyed that little project and I hope you download it and have some fun with it.